Hello, everyone. Welcome to Good Tips for Hard Times, where we find smart people who have great advice to help you get through your days. Thank you so much for joining us. I am Anita Sarkeesian. I'm a media critic, public speaker, and the executive director of the Games and Online Harassment Hotline, which is a new emotional support resource for gaming communities. Um, before I bring on our guest this week, I just wanted to thank all of you for helping out with our campaign last uh, the last two weeks. We finished that up on Thursday, and we were super successful at raising funds to help support four nonprofits in the gaming space. And so, y'all, thank you so much for that. And thank you for everyone that tuned into our big seven-hour live stream for Feminist Frequencies 11th birthday. Oh, no, I'm getting messages that our audio is shitty. Um, I'm getting messages that our audio is fine. I'm not really sure <laughs> what to take of these mixed messages. So I'm going to keep talking until somebody says something else to me. Anyways, I'm really excited to bring on our guests this week and talk about this big, meaty topic. Um, I actually, well, let me, let me, let's bring them on and then I'll tell this story. Hi, Amelia and Emily. Nagos Hi. So our guests, Amelia and Emily Nagoski, Nagoski. I got that right. Yeah, I don't. I didn't need to clarify, but I just needed that validation. Um, so they, they, as you can see, are identical twins with doctorates in opposite fields, which I love about y'all. One is a scientist, the other a musician, and both are teachers and writers who approach well-being from the perspective of research and practical experience. So Emily, uh, you might know her from her best-selling book, Come As You Are, and she has a PhD in, be in health behavior with a minor in human sexuality from Indiana University and an MS in counseling. I'm so tired just <laughs> reading that. That is very impressive. Um, and uh, she's been a sex educator for 20 years and currently works at the inaugural as the inaugural director no. of Well, no, is that out of date? I don't know where date? the bio is from, but that is... Uh... No. Nope. Great. I did. I worked there. I worked there for Great. eight years. What do you do now? Anymore. Uh, now I spend most of my time training sex therapists and medical providers in the science of women's sexual well-being so they stop uh, perpetuating myths to their patients and clients. Great. And also, Emily is the one with the blue hair, <laughs> in yeah. case y'all are wondering. Um, Amelia, Please correct me if any of this is wrong, but you are, Amelia is a conductor with the DMA and conducting from the University of Connecticut, an assistant professor and coordinator of music at Western New England University. I got a promotion. I'm an associate professor now. Fuck yeah. Congratulations. Not just a promotion. She got tenure. Tenure. No yeah, way. Totally. That's great. Congratulations. <laughs> Thanks. Um, is, there, should, is there anything? I feel like I shouldn't keep reading <laughs> Is yeah, there any, that's uh, great. How else would you? Yes, great. So basically, long long story short, they're very accomplished women who have written this book that is incredible. It's called Burnout, The Secret to Unlocking the Stress Cycle. And this is what we're here to talk about today. So um, I first learned about y'all last year at the XOXO Fest. You did a talk that um, I, I sobbed through the whole thing. And I was like... I, th I think I'm burned out. <laughs> like, like all these things are just mean a lot to me. And then you all started singing Moana somehow, which made total sense in the in talk. The context. Um, and then I just, it was like, I just, it was, it was gross. It was, it was very gross. You probably heard me from the, from the stands. Um, so I went and rewatched that talk and was like, oh, I'm going to pull the clip out and it's really cute. And then I started crying again. So I just was <laughs> like, we're not, we're not doing this right now. Um, so I would love us to get into this because I think this topic of burnout is something that a lot of people resonate with and a lot of people um, don't know what to do about, but like feel, have this feeling around it. And I particularly like how, and, and maybe we can get into this too, that like this isn't a sort of traditional self-helpy kind of book where it's like, just just think about being better and you'll be better or just breathe a little bit and you'll be fine. Like the acknowledgments of patriarchy and white supremacy, especially with what's happening, con continues to happen, but especially the news right now um, around the, um, the horrific police brutality against black folks. Like all of that contributes to these spaces of stress and these spaces of like not feeling safe in the world that contribute to feelings of burnout. So like I'm hoping we can get and in, dive into all of that over the next little bit. So f first I want to talk a little bit about like how did this book even come to be? Like how do you go from being a conductor and like a sex educator to writing a book about burnout? 
It started with me. Uh, so Come As You Are has one chapter about like stress and emotion processing, even though it's a sex book, because it turns out the single best predictor of a woman's sexual well-being is her overall well-being. Surprise. Uh, so there's this one chapter about stress and feelings. Uh, but then in 2015, as I was traveling around book touring, uh, people kept saying, yeah, all that sex science is great, Emily. Thanks for that. But you know, the one chapter that really changed everything for me was that one chapter on stress and feelings. And I had worked so hard on the sex science and I was really surprised. Um, I forget how impactful that stuff is. So I said this to Amelia and she said, I, I was not surprised at all because I, I'm a conductor, so I know that what it takes to feel and express your feelings doesn't just come naturally to everybody. It requires some training for some of us, a lot of us. And in fact, when I learned the stuff that was in that chapter, it saved my life twice. So I reminded Emily of that and she said, we should write a book about that. So that's where burnout came. <laughs> Because I was remembering what it's like to see, I don't know if you've ever seen your identical twin crying in a hospital, Johnny, but it's impactful, especially <laughs> if you are a health educator whose job it is to teach people how not to end up in that situation. Sure. Yeah. I, that, well, there are layers there. <laughs> layers of emotional <laughs> resonance there. Absolutely. That's intense. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry that you dealt with that, but I'm so glad that we got something amazing for other people out of that as well and yourself she's obviously. feeling much better now yeah and i have to say i i used to hate it when people say this but i'm actually glad that i went through that terrible difficult thing because i learned so much from it and i grew and i got so much healthier on the other side than i ever could have been if i hadn't gotten that wake-up call now i would really love it if the book and the stuff that we talk about in public would help other people so that they don't have to go that deep and dark into the hole before they realize that something needs to change so i hope that my dark experience will help others not have to go that yeah. dark. Just sobbing in public is a good sort of intermediate, like you're in the direction, <laughs> but you haven't hit bottom yet. Oh yeah. Absolutely. I, I do. I feel like too often we don't know that it's here until it's here. And then you're like, oh, this is bad, bad. I guess let's yeah. read some books about it. And at that point, like... <laughs> You're kind of fucked. So um... that's sort of exactly how it went. Amelia got out of the hospital and I arrived in a panic with a stack of like peer reviewed science, <laughs> which is, I guess, how I express my love as I show up with like, here's research on what feelings are and what to do with them. And uh, it worked. She learned it fast, so much so that I literally forgot how much had changed for her in like less than a year. Wow. Like once you know this stuff, you can't unknow it. Absolutely. It's just there forever. Nice. Well, so let's get into this. So let's start with like, what is burnout? What is this feeling that people can't necessarily describe, but know intimately? How we define it is the experience of feeling like you're not enough and simultaneously being worried that you're not doing enough. So being overwhelmed and exhausted by everything you have to do and yet still somehow worried that you're not doing enough. That's what we define burnout as. There is like a technical definition from the Herbert Freudenberger and the psychological research that has three distinct characteristics, blah, blah, blah. But if someone says the word burnout to you and you go, yes, then you're burnt out. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Okay, so uh, I really like that definition. I think it's very attainable and, and accessible. And you immediately are like, oh, God, that's me. Mm -hmm. um, so stress, obviously, is such a huge factor in, of burnout. And I feel like um, you you articulate so clearly in your book and in, in your lectures and work around the difference between a stress and a stressor and how those are how we have to approach those differently. Can you expand on, or can you explain that to our audience? Oh, heck yeah. This is the starting point. Uh, and that is that um, so you have stressors, which are the things that activate the stress in your body. These are usually things out in the external world. Uh, evolutionarily, this will be being chased by a lion. These days, it tends to be the mansplainer in that meeting that you're in, or the cat caller, or the news, or the like pandemic, or whatever else. Those are stressors. They're uh, things that activate a stress response in our body. The stress itself is the physiological event that happens in response. It is the adrenaline and cortisol that courses through your bloodstream 
extreme. It's the physical reaction of increased heart rate, increased blood pressure, increased respiration rate. All of this biologically is in preparation to help you do one thing, which is to run, to use your muscles immediately to escape whatever the threat is. In the environment where we evolved, Running is an adaptive strategy that uh, deals with the stressor, the lion that's chasing you. And so that is what our bodies are, tr are expect to do. These days, the behaviors that deal with our stressors are not the same as the behaviors that deal with our the stress itself. So like the way to deal with the stressor of the mansplainer in the meeting is you smile and you nod and you go, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm, thanks for that contribution. That was a really good point that Janet made 10 minutes ago. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> and you're like, like inside your heart is pumping and like biologically you want to grab a spear and hunt him down. Um, but I don't know what you're talking you're about. So I've never been in that situation. Right? <laughs> so... What you, so what has happened now is that uh, because our bodies are in this strange environment, the process of dealing with the stress has become separate from the process of dealing with the stressor, and you have to do both. You have to engage in behaviors that help your body complete the stress response cycle that got activated by the stressor, which will almost always have to happen separately from your experience of the stressor right then. Okay, cool. So what does that mean? Like how, so you have the stressor that is your stupid boss that is mansplaining and shitty. And, um, and then you have your body's physiological reaction to stress and that it just like piles on, right? You just build on stress, on stress, on stress. So if you're to deal with your body, right? Like, do you need to do physical things for your body? You know what I mean? Like if it's a body issue, how do you deal with that? Uh, that is actually good news um, because uh, if you've ever woken up in the middle of the night, like sweating and your heart racing from a dream, or if you've ever been really nervous and had an upset stomach before like a, a first date, then you know that even when there is no actual physical threat in the room, your imagination can initiate a stress response cycle all on its own because your imagination comes out of your brain, your nervous system, your imagination is part of your body. So yes, physical activity is the most efficient way for most people to complete the stress response cycle that is true, not for everybody. That was not the case for me at all. For me, the very first way I found into this dealing with the stress itself as a cycle in my body was imagination. I would imagine myself through a story. The, ver the uh, example I used in the XOXO talk is I would be on the elliptical machine. I was already an exerciser. It just didn't help me deal with my stress. So I was be on the elliptical machine. And I would imagine myself as Godzilla tromping on the university where I was getting my doctorate and it was so cathartic. I didn't actually go and destroy anything. I didn't physically change anything that I was doing before. I just changed my imagination. The story that I told myself while I engaged in this activity, now instead of being just hot and sweaty and tired at the end of the workout, I would feel elated and powerful. And it was a completely different feeling, not because of what my body did, but because I imagined myself all the way through. Um, and we know that this works not just when we're doing physical activities, but also just the act of creative self-expression. Um, Emily uh, talks about, do you want to tell this story, Emily, about using writing? Sure. Uh, so uh, yes, physical activity. If you're a person for whom exercise gets you, if you know that at the end of a run, you're going to be like, oh, yes, I feel so much better now. You're yes. a natural exerciser and you should go to physical activity every time. If that's not you, try using your imagination because if your imagination can activate a stress response cycle, it can also complete a stress response cycle. Um, and sometimes your stress is so big that you need more than one strategy at a time. So I had a day at the job I don't have anymore uh, where four students in a row uh, told me that they had been sexually assaulted. And my job in that moment is to help them get access to the resources they need in order to recover. I felt very confident that all four of them were going to get access to those resources. And they were at the beginning of a story that I felt really confident had a happy ending. But all I got to experience on that day was four different tragedies, uh, enraging, infuriating, depressing, tragedies. Uh, so I had this stuff in my body and I rode my bike home four and a half miles. And that was not enough. When I got home, I was still, my shoulders were trying to be my earrings. Um, and so I sat down at my computer and I wrote 
I worked on my romance novel. I wrote the happily ever after. I wrote the scene where I put the hero on his knees begging to deserve the heroine. And I could feel in my body that all that like difficult emotion was transforming. It felt to me like how paper dissolves in the rain. And then you can like take the mush and turn it into fresh new sheets of paper. And I rewrote that emotion into the happy ending that I knew would one day exist for those survivors. Um, but I could make it real for myself in the process of writing. Writing is not for everybody. For some people, it's going to be painting. For some people, it's going to be a performance. For some people, it's going to be music. Whatever your thing is, you can like knit your rage out, whatever the, your creative self-expression is. Um, so we've already got uh, physical activity. We've got imagination. We've got creative self-expression. There's like a dozen of these in chapter. Like This is all chapter one. Yeah. Right, right at the beginning of the book. It's really, I like yeah. that you just like put, you're like, if you don't read anything else, here you go. Here's the solution. That's exactly right. That's yeah. exactly right. Um, I am so relieved that there are so many options because while like I do fitness, sometimes uh, I go through phases. I am not a runner. Like I like, I cycle for, um, um, not for fitness, just for transportation. Uh, and like, I, your story like people's stories about like the relief they get from like hard cardio and, and that sort of thing I'm like that's not for everyone and that mobility issues like there's got to be other ways and so I really love that um you offer there's these also there's also accessibility issues not everyone can get someplace safe where they can do hard cardiovascular activity yeah absolutely um asthma <laughs> I was like I just yeah. I can't I can't run yeah. like it doesn't yeah. also I'm getting old and my knees hurt so <laughs> That said, I because I as as people uh, in the EXO talk, which I highly recommend everyone take a look at as well. You do you do talk about that deep release that comes from um, from the physical fitness, which you know I've gotten a couple of times, but it's not something that um, I can I can sustain. And so, like, how do we find these other creative outlets? Yeah. I think can that I ask what does work for you, like what gets you to the place you can be like, oh yes, I don't know yet, and this has been my like decade problem, uh, and so. Um, there has been, I've done a little, I was thinking about this the other day because I remember, I, I was, so last night I went to skim the the rest of the book that I hadn't finished, right, just to whatever, and I just sat there for two hours and actually read the whole thing. <laughs> like, I, did, I didn't mean to, it's just, it's, I really, I love it. I think it's really good. Um, and I remember that I was doing aerial, you know, like circus aerial silks. I took yeah. a couple of classes on that and I would walk out of that feeling euphoric. And I was like, go. oh, my God, that's what they're talking about. <laughs> like, yes. That is exactly the feeling. And it's only ever happened that one time. So maybe yeah. I need to so do that So often things that are a combination of that creative self-expression plus physical activity, yeah. creative self-expression plus imagination, connection, connection to, to other people, connection laughter. to other people, connection yeah. to the divine, connection to animals, connection to yes. nature. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and also, nature is actually another one that I found that like, you know, it, it's not like an instantaneous euphoria, but it is there is a release that happens in those spaces. And also it depends on the larger context of your life. If you are at a place in your life where you've had a long period of a lot of increasing stress and you've never had a chance to let that go, then you probably have a lot of built up stress that needs to be let go of. So the first time you exercise, it might not do anything. The first time you write down what your rage is, that might not accomplish anything. But if you keep going, eventually you're going to get through the backlog and you're going to be able to keep up with it. Yeah, absolutely. Because all of us are walking around with decades of incomplete stress response cycles in our bodies. Oh, yeah. Because oh, yeah, our bodies can... are such a gift. They will hold on to that for us <laughs> for as long as it takes. They so will like... only very gradually degrade your organs. Yeah, only the mean gradually. kid in middle school, that interaction from that day that you remember that you hated in junior high that's still in there unless yeah. you let yourself move through it like it goes back your whole life it could be stuck in there this is one of the reasons why it was hard for me to acknowledge that bodies hold emotion that emotions are a physical process because if emotions are in your body and i've never like done the rage purging thing I have so much rage if I've never. So that was one of the reasons why I was like, I don't want this to be true. And I denied it, was, it for a long time. It was too big. Yeah. It was, I, I, it couldn't be true because it, could, it would have been way too much. It turns out that it was way too much. I was hospitalized. And so I, then I was like, well, I need to start working through this backlog. Yeah, absolutely. So this, um, you know, this is not necessarily the topic, but, you know, I can't help but think about trauma, right? Like trauma sits in the body. Trauma is a type of stress, yep. um, especially if you're dealing with, 
you know, childhood trauma that you've never, that, that, that you, that has just been sitting in your bodies for so long. So uh, I just, I want to recommend The Body Keeps the Score, which is a book oh, that yeah. is foundational for a lot of folks and, and like changed my life in a lot of ways. And I started learning about some of these ideas that you've been putting out there. I, I really value the accessibility that you, the accessible language and metaphors that you use for like modern day uh, dealings with this, where The Body Keeps the Score is, is not a hard read, but it's more clinical for sure. But it's a great intro to this idea. And Bessel, though he talks about, Bessel van der Kolk, the author, who's a psychiatrist and trauma specialist, uh, talks about uh, not just like war trauma and sexual violence and also neglect. He doesn't, though, talk about the sort of like daily stress of living in a patriarchy, living in a white supremacist, as heteropatriarchal, rapidly exploitative, late capitalist society like sort of the injury that that does. And it was very central to our goal with the book to put that stuff, to be like, this is real. You live in this toxic environment. And that is why this is hard. And here are things you can do even though it's hard. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. One of the problems is that the stress that Emily was talking about with the heart pounding and the heavy breathing and the sweat, a lot of times that happens at a level that's below conscious awareness. So you don't even know that it's happening or because you need to deny it and suppress it in the moment in order to be polite or in order to keep yourself safe. You shut it down and you're not even aware of it. So in that moment, you can't complete the stress response cycle and you're not even aware of the stress response cycle. That doesn't mean it didn't happen. And that doesn't Survivors mean you don't need to deal with it. Survivors in particular have a really intense skill of being able to shut down their emotional reaction before they're even aware that they had it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this is a hard pivot, uh, but just something I was thinking about earlier is because uh, because we were talking about like creative as an outlet, which I think mm -hmm. a lot of people understand. I, I did want to address the folks like me who have turned their hobbies into their jobs and then no longer have hobbies. Yeah. Um, or that your um, your job is so consuming, or you're in this like fucked up capitalist state where every time you start a hobby, you figure out you try to figure out how to turn it into part of Mom, your job, true. you know, so like social media, all of that kind of stuff. And so th that was another struggle that I've had of like, what do I do for fun? Like, this what is fun? Like, how do I when I realized that I was severely burnt out trying to, to navigate that space? So like, exper like giving folks space to experiment with. Um, with what they find in like get a ukulele i don't know like get see yeah. if you like that go for a hike like try running or i mean not running what? sorry um try like knitting or whatever just to give yourself things to do and separate it from your work life what i recommend in a very specific conscious easy to define way is find something that you're bad at but you enjoy i horseback ride i am not good <laughs> at it the last time i horseback rode i literally fell off and like broke my ass um, I am not a good horseback rider, but I do it because I love it. It's this combination of physical activity, connection with this animal, like being out in nature. It's like a win, win, win. And I, there's no way that this could ever be a job or anything that I teach. Like, I'm just so bad at it. I so find that. something that you're bad at, but you like it anyway. <laughs> I love that so much. I am horrible at drawing and that I think um, every now and again, I try to draw things and I'm like, oh yeah, I would never put this I would never I would never share this <laughs> but yeah cool um so one so I want to talk about this idea that you introduce in the book the human giver syndrome I think that's really related to some of the sort of micro daily issues that I think you uh bring up that are part of the stressors and the stress cycles in our lives can can you tell us what that is <laughs> the human giver do you want to do it Emily or should I do it I can do it. Uh, okay. So we take the language from a very dark but fairly short book by the moral philosopher Kate Mann, M-A-N-N-E. -N -N -E. The title of her book is Down Girl, The Logic of Misogyny. If you have the spoons for it, highly recommend. But it is, it's a lot of stories about sexual violence and harassment. Um, in it, she posits a world where there's two types of humans. There are the human beings who have a moral obligation to be their full humanity, to be as uh, competitive, acquisitive, and entitled as they need to be in order to maximize their being. You can hear it in the word, human being. Being. And the other group of humans are the human givers who have a moral obligation to give their full humanity in support of other people, to give their time, their attention, their patience, their smiles, their kindness, their warmth, their bodies, their hopes and dreams, sometimes their entire lives sacrificed on the altar of someone else's comfort and convenience. Guess which one women are? 
I could is, never guess. <laughs> and it is obviously not so simple as like men are the beings and women are the givers. We are both married to cishet dudes who are natural human givers. And the dynamic in a relationship between two givers is really different than the relationship between a giver and a being because the giver will give because that's their moral obligation. And the human being will feel free to take everything that the giver gives. And the more the giver gives, the more entitled the being feels to take everything. So you have this like totally exhausting uh, situation. The rules for being a human giver as a woman in our culture is you have to be pretty, happy, yet calm, generous, and above all, attentive to the needs of others. And because this is your moral obligation, if you fall short in any way of that moral obligation, you deserve to be punished. And if there's no one around to punish you for you, you just go ahead and beat the shit out of yourself. If you dare to stop being attentive to the needs of others and dare to be attentive to your own needs by, I don't know, getting seven hours of sleep one night. Fair Nobody enough. ever comes into work and says, I got eight solid hours of sleep last night. And people are like, yes, right on, good for you. Uh, part of the toxicity of human giver syndrome is that uh, it, turns exhaustion uh, and burnout into a virtue so that when somebody says, you know, I got eight hours of sleep last night, someone else says, good that's for so you. good for you. Good for you. Self-care Self is so, so important. important. <laughs> I was up until four o'clock in the morning frosting the cupcakes for Becky's birthday party, but good for you. That's human giver syndrome. Now, it's not that being a giver is inherently toxic or dangerous. Right. Being a human giver is only a syndrome in the context of the existence of human beings who feel entitled to everything that you are and have. When you are surrounded by givers, being a giver is the best possible solution for creating a world that is supportive, where no one burns out because everyone jumps in and notices when you need something, notices when you need support, and they're there for you. Uh, it, it only is a system that fails when there are human beings involved and when they truly do have the power. Right, right. So like, is this what, it, like, how do we deal with that? Like what, like if you're like, oh God, you just described me, like what, yeah. are, are there steps folks can take or like, how do yes. you navigate actually this? It have been the most important thing I learned in the process of writing the book. I learned to recognize what it feels like in my body when I'm interacting with a human being who feels entitled to take everything I give them versus what it feels like to en engage with a fellow giver. And like, I don't enjoy this experience let me restate that. I've been in therapy for 20 years. When I was young, I felt like the, the giving uh, to a human being uh, was uh, a way to prove how good I am, that one day I'd be able to give enough to be able to satisfy this human being, and then I would win. It turns out that's not true. There's no such thing as giving enough to a human being. So in the course of 20 years of therapy, I have learned uh, to strongly prefer the feeling of being with the human giver who's going to share with me everything I invest in a relationship that they're going to invest back. So when I notice myself in this kind of like human being, human giver relationship, I just, as much as I can, divest from that connection and put that energy, that time, those resources into relationships with fellow givers. Nice. Um, yeah, that, yeah. I, I'm, <sighs> I don't even know what to say about that. I'm just like taking it all in. Um, yeah, the good news is that once you recognize the dynamic, it becomes so clear that, oh, this is someone who feels entitled to everything that I have and everything that I am. They are not entitled to everything that I have and everything that I am. Therefore, I'm not gonna feel obligated in the way that they need me to or want me to. So th I think this actually segues a little bit into another concept that you talk about that I really love and have tried to bring into my life, this idea of self-care versus community care. Yeah. Um, and I think that that is, is ties into this kind of giver syndrome. Like, you know, um, can you talk about Absolutely. the difference between self-care and what you mean by community care? Or I might be using that word, but. Uh, that yeah, well, we do say in the book very, I mean, explicitly, we say the cure for burnout is not self-care, cannot be self-care. The cure for burnout is all of us caring for each other. Self-care of you 
just maybe selfishly taking a bubble bath and giving yourself an exfoliating mask. Um, that can be, that can feel really great. It can be soothing in the short term, but if you're living in a context of human giver syndrome, where now you've given yourself a bubble bath and a pedicure and you just feel guilty and bad, like you've done something morally wrong because you've taken resources for yourself, how dare you? The way we get out of that trap is for the other givers around us to turn to us and go, yeah, you need this, you need this help. Because our friend at work who said, I got I got nine hours of sleep last night, that doesn't just happen. It happens because everyone in her household agreed that it mattered that she get adequate sleep and they helped. We do not need, I'm so tired of the narrative of persistence and grit. We do not need more grit. We need more help. Fuck grit. We do not need to persist. We need more support. We need people to turn toward our difficult feelings with kindness and compassion and to show up with instrumental support so that we can go to bed at the time our body requires. That doesn't so that just when, happen spontaneously. And when we go into work the next day, our whole household has supported us and given us this opportunity to get a full night's sleep. And we go into work and say, I got nine hours of sleep last night. I feel amazing. And then their coworker says, good for you. Self-care is so important. Well, then all that self-care has now turned into a thing that causes them stress because their relationships at work aren't ideal. What we need is a community where we're all gonna be turning towards each other uh, with kindness and compassion. Yeah, Sorry. Our, our shortcut for this is, uh, we call it uh, the bubble of love. Everybody needs a bubble where like once you walk into that bubble, nobody's going to engage in like fat shaming body talk. Nobody's going to engage in human giver syndrome expectations that they're entitled to take anything. Yeah. Everyone is going to care for each other. We're all going to sit around and I know what this sounds like, but we read a lot of very hardcore affective neuroscience and it turns out the answer is we're going to sit around and talk about our feelings. <laughs> Hell Yeah. We're going to do it. Um, and, yeah. and that's the thing, I think, sort of like to, to tie some of these concepts together of like, we're not going to remove stressors from our life. That's not like a thing. We're not going to have a perfect life. We're not, it's not going to be, you know, like your workplace might suck and you're, you're, you might go to work and you might have Becky or Karen being like, oh, you got sleep, blah, 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 whatever. Right. But so dealing with that stress this the, in your body is an essential part of being able to go back and 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 sort of tolerate the the yes. toxic parts of life. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, having no stress in your life is not a realistic goal. It's not even a a goal that you would actually enjoy if you achieved it. There's no sense of peace at the end that you're going to have. That's just it's not a thing. Um I don't know if who watched the last season of The Good Place, but I might spoil it a little bit for a second. Like they all go to heaven and in heaven everything's perfect. So everybody who's in heaven like starts to, to lose their intelligence and to get really like numb and dulled to life because there needs to be some challenge. There needs to be some friction in order to create strength in you. Um, some stress is good for you, absolutely. But we don't want it to overwhelm us. And the problem with the white societal patriarchy is that it gives us stress all day, every day. And then it also tells us that it doesn't exist, that oh no, sexism's over. Like we had the feminist movement. There's no racism anymore. There was a black president. There's no more racism. So we have this system that wounds us over and over and then says, stop hitting yourself, stop hitting yourself. And you're like, wait, what? So you're being tortured and gaslit at the same time. Yeah. Uh, and that the good creates news. overwhelming stress. But the good news is, sorry, it got really dark. I'm so sorry. <laughs> the good news is when you separate the stress from the stressor, that means that you don't have to wait for the stressors to go away before you can deal with the stress in your body. You don't have to wait for utopia peaceful perfection. In fact, you can't wait for utopia peaceful perfection until you deal with the stress in your body because when you deal with the stress in your body, that keeps you alive and happy and comfortable so that you can go back out and fight against the oppressors. Yeah, that's why the theme of our XOXO talk was that everybody has permission to take a break from the hard work they are doing and restore their mammalian bodies. These like monkey suits we walk around in like there's maintenance that goes with it. Yeah. We would never treat our pets the way we treat our own bodies. Uh, and when we take the time to do that. And in the book, in the rest chapter, what proportion of our time should be devoted to energy renewal, rest, 
42%, 10 hours a day on average. Obviously, it's not going to be that much every single day, but it should average out to that. It's like eight hours of sleep and two hours of all the other energy creating behaviors that we engage in. Yeah. So that, great. Let's talk about rest then. Um, you know, what, like, re- what is it? What's rest? Is it sleeping? Is it watching TV? Like, what does it mean to rest? Yeah. Rest is anything that fuels you, that increases the amount of energy you feel that you have. Um, the opposite of rest is anything that costs you energy, that tires you out, that fatigues you. So yes, absolutely. Rest is sleep seven to nine hours every night as much as you can. And we actually did a whole podcast episode about it's like an we hour did and a half. Three just episodes. Three on episodes sleep. just about sleep. So if you want all the details on that, yes, it's sleep, but it's not just sleep. It's also mindful eating or mindful food shopping, basically paying attention to your food in a mindful way. It's also a uh, stress reducing conversation. Well, hold on. Sorry. Uh, I just yeah. want to clarify the mindful eating that I just want to clarify that you mean just being conscious of eating, not necessarily dieting or being, you know, like, oh, mindful yeah. eating is the opposite of dieting. This is just uh, turning toward your food experience with kindness and compassion. Yeah. Eating a, a hot fudge sundae and really taking pleasure in the hot fudge sundae <laughs> can be very stress reducing, can be fulfilling and nourishing and restful. Absolutely. It can feel like you took a vacation in a three minute Sunday. Absolutely. Please, please do that. (laughs) That sounds amazing. Um, uh, Another thing is, isn't that better than just like shoving an ice cream cone in your mouth while you're driving? Yes. Right. That's the difference between just eating and using food as rest. (laughs) Yeah. Food as rest. Um, A stress reducing conversation with uh, someone you love and trust, someone in your bubble of love. So um, say for 15 minutes, you both sit on the couch and one of you talks for seven and a half minutes and then the other one talks for seven and a half minutes and you just share what happened in your day, whatever you wanna say, and uh, there's no criticism, there's no judgment, there's just love, that kind of conversation, absolutely stress reducing, absolutely nourishing and restful. Exercise can also be nourishing and restful. If you are the kind of person who f- gets off the treadmill and feel like you have more energy, there there are people like that. If you're one of those people, rest <laughs> is active rest. Exercise is rest for you. Yeah. All right. Um, so we had a question in chat that I wanted to bring up if I can find it. Here we go. Um, it, it, there we go. Um, the question is, is there a difference between burnout and compassion fatigue in terms of how it needs to be addressed in the body? It definitely feels a little different, at least, is the question. So, so technically, compassion fatigue is caused by the specific experience of caring too much for too long. Um, and so it comes really specifically from the giving, from the caretaking. I, for one, am like deeply worried about our medical providers. Um, they're not just experiencing compassion fatigue. They're, there's going to be a whole wave of like trauma recovery that has to happen for those medical providers. And it's because of the caregiving. So compassion fatigue comes from caring for too much for too long. And there are great resources specifically. I love the book Trauma Stewardship by someone whose name I totally forget, but the book is over here, but Trauma Stewardship and all the books by that cluster of authors uh, specifically address this. Um, And so we've been talking a lot about like compassion and connection and the bubble of love, but we wanna recognize that our bodies are built to oscillate through the stress response cycle from being stressed out into peace, back to stress, back to peace. We're meant to cycle into rest, but not we're not supposed to stay asleep forever. We're supposed to oscillate into rest and back into activity and back into rest. We're supposed to oscillate from deep connection into autonomy, back to connection and back to autonomy. When people are experiencing compassion fatigue, they often feel like if they do not uh, if they dare to take space away, they have uh, given up or quit and that they have failed somehow because they paused, because they took time to do something other than the thing that is driving their sense of meaning and purpose. Doing the stuff that drives your sense of meaning and purpose is chapter three, like it's that important. But taking time away from your source of meaning and purpose is also equally important, hence knitting and horseback riding and writing romance novels and whatever the thing is that you do that is energy renewing and not just that one thing. But for a more comprehensive answer, trauma stewardship. 
Nice. Um, I think that this next question is, you kind of just answered it. It's um, how do you deal with the guilt that often comes with taking time or space yourself after burning out? Yeah, if you feel guilt about using resources for yourself, that is human giver syndrome. So you need someone around you who is a giver to reinforce you, you deserve resources for yourself. That is why self-care is not the cure for burnout. All of us caring for each other is the cure for burnout. That is a sign that you need help. This is an opportunity to talk about the last chapter in the book, actually. It's called The Mad Woman in the Attic. Basically, all of us, on the day you're born, if you're gender socialized feminine, um, they go, it's a girl, and they start teaching you that there are like rules of what you're allowed to do and what you're not. And uh, the more, the older you get, the more you recognize that there is a gap between who you really are and who this script is telling you to be. And into that gap grows the mad woman. Her job is to cope with the enormous chasm between who you actually are and who the world expects you to be. And she only has two choices. She can either be really mad at the world for having those bullshit expectations, or she can be really mad at you for falling short. And when people feel guilt about pausing what they're doing, um, that is their mad woman being like, no, the cultural expectation is you're going to fight, 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 and you're never going to stop fighting, and you're going to sacrifice everything you have and are in the name of this thing or else. And that's that's uh, your mad woman. And uh, this is why Amelia sang Moana. Don't because make me cry. <laughs> the mad woman, for me, the mad woman is very much like Teka, the lava monster. And here's the thing. This is the evidence-based solution is you uh, personify that mean lady in your head, that cruel, vicious stranger in your head who says these terrible things about you and beats the shit out of you and carries a whip all day, every day. Am I being too explicit about this? (laughs) Welcome to the inside of my head. Um, Like when you have these things happen, she goes off, right? And you're like, oh, hello, mad woman. And for me, it's Tikka, the lava monster. And what's true about Tikka? I'm about to spoil the shit out of Moana. Moana notices that the swirl over the heart of Teka, the lava monster, matches the swirl on this green stone, the heart of Tefiti. And Moana realizes that this big, scary lava monster, she holds the monster's heart in the palm of her hand. And if she can turn toward the big, scary monster with kindness and compassion, let her come to me, she tells the ocean. I have crossed the horizon to find you. (laughs) And she strides bravely toward this monster that's coming at her. I have stolen the heart. You're not allowed to take a break, right? And she stands there bravely with her hair flying in the air and is like, I have to find you. I have the thing you've been waiting for. (laughs) This is not who you (laughs) are. And she puts the heart into the lava monster. You know who you are. heat and the ash fall away and what emerges is Tefiti, the goddess of life and abundance, the ultimate source of joy and pleasure in our lives. When we can turn toward the cruelest, meanest part of ourselves with that kindness and compassion, our own worst enemy, then we can befriend it and it totally takes the power. Now, let me say Amelia's mad woman is nothing like this. Do you want to talk about your mad woman? Sure. My mad woman is a vision I've been having in dreams since I was two or three years old. And it's a a little wiggly ball of dust and a gigantic wiggly ball of dust. And it's the sensation of intimidation and fear that the little ball feels and that the big ball seems to be given. And there's this elastic sense of it's a it's this sense of these two things. And the um, do you know what a dolly zoom is? where you zoom in with the camera, but you also pull it away. So the, f- the thing in the frame stays the same, but the background changes. And it's that v- vertiginous sense of swooshing. It's a physical sensation of vertigo and this vision of these two little things. And when I have this sensation, I know that what has happened is my mad woman is saying, you fucked up, the world is not to blame. It's you, you don't fit in, you did the wrong thing. And then I go, oh, right. Do I blame the world? Do I blame me? Or do I just acknowledge the chasm that always exists between me and what the world expects of me? We did a podcast episode called The Abyss, 
Yeah. Which is about learning to tolerate living with the persistent, unbridgeable chasm between who you actually are and who the world expects you to be, that it's totally possible. And in fact, joy comes from a life lived in peace with the abyss. Amelia wrote a song about it. Who does the world say that I should be? And what do I do if I don't agree? Rational me says that I am enough. My primate brain says not fitting is rough. Anyway, solutions are clear. I should be myself. Uh, and you the, can just uh, sing the chorus. The abyss. I'm not in the right key, so it's way too low. Abyss. <laughs> anyway. I, y'all That's can the come on. episode of the podcast if you want to hear me actually sing in the right key with like a ukulele accompaniment. Y'all can come on any day. This is just <laughs> the best. Even though you made me cry, that's okay. I'm sorry. Uh, that's okay. Actually, I'm not sorry. No, no sorry. you're not. You're not even a little bit. Uh, fun fact: crying is also stress relief. Uh, it's so, one of the yeah. twelve yeah. evidence-based stress response things. There's yeah. actually um, um, a strategy for making your crying purge rage, and that is to pay attention to the crying, not to keep re- reciting in your mind whatever that thing was that made you so upset, but just to say, I'm going to let go of the context and just turn toward the physical sensation of the crying. How much snot is coming out of my nose? How hot do I feel? Where do I feel tension? And you just pay attention to that until it goes away. And it does go tunnels. away. You have to go all the way through the darkness to get to the light at the end. But if you allow yourself to go through it, you will always get to the light at the end. And if you don't get to the end, that's when you call for help. Help. Because uh, it's not about self-care. It's about community care. Exactly. Oh, I love it. Um, okay. Just I want to recap really quick because folks popped in and out of the, the stream a little bit. So um, there's a difference between the stress and the stressor, and we can deal with those separately. Um, the human giver syndrome, I can't even do that in a short way. Look it up. It's in the book. Burnout. Moral obligation to be pretty happy, calm, generous, and attentive to the needs of others. And if you fall short, you should beat the shit out of yourself. <laughs> yes. But don't do that. Uh, fight those. Fight fight that. Yeah, that's that's the yourself. problem. Just for the that's record, the that's the problem yeah, yeah. and a lie. Yeah. Um, the solution is caring for each other. Yep. And rest, whether it's actual sleep or active rest, uh, doing things that make you feel feel rested and and um, you know it's it's not just that feeling of like how do you like I so we just did this giant basically I spent a month fundraising and did a seven hour live stream and I was like I'm taking days off after this and I was like literally every day was like I don't know how to relax I don't know how to relax what is rest what is relax how to relax and so this the timing of this is absolutely perfect to just remind me of some of these these tools that I have that are available to me that are totally free. They're not, you don't have to spend a bunch of money to do any of this stuff. So people often need a kind of methadone rest, not rest per se, but something that brings them down from the chaos. So that's when you like train for a marathon or write a novel. Yeah, absolutely. So if you want to do like give one takeaway uh, to the audience, if there's one thing that they could learn from today or from this work about burnout, what would that be? Uh, the, if you don't, if you change anything after learning what we've talked about, let it be getting more sleep. And if you feel selfish for sleeping, which we hear all the time, remember that taking care of yourself is not selfish. You can't spell resist without rest. If you're going to be part of the resistance, we need you to be healthy and well rested and ready to go to fight and to vote. And I would say when you're feeling overwhelmed and exhausted, it is not that you need more grit. You don't need to work harder. You need more help. Nice. I love that. Well, Emily uh, and Amelia Nagoski. Yeah. I didn't even have to look at my notes, even though I was scrolling (laughs) for them. Um, Please check out their book, Burnout, The Secret to Unlocking the Stress Cycle. Um, It honestly is really phenomenal, and we will definitely link it in the chat for you all. Um, Is there any other places folks can find more about what you're working on these days or about you all? Yeah, we're doing a podcast called The Feminist Survival Project 2020, which Emily wanted to start um, last November because she predicted that 2020 might be kind of difficult. So we decided we would talk about some things that are hard for other people and maybe like spread some information, but mostly we make it for ourselves as a thing that we can do to help each other feel better. So it's evidence-based strategies for coping with the shit show. All right. And where can folks find that? 
feministsurvivalproject.com. And we're on the social medias at FSP 2020. Nice. Oh, that's awesome. I can't wait to check that out. Thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. And also for making me cry, which I was like, not going to happen. And then here, there, it happened. Hopefully you feel better. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, y'all. I hope that you enjoy that conversation as much as I did. Um, and and also, if y'all are, if you cried at the Moana part, I did too. So don't feel guilty about that. Um, I want to thank all the mods for keeping this space friendly. And thanks to all of you for tuning in. I know that we had some technical problems and a, a, a several of you were saying that there were some sync issues and audio issues. Um, we are going to upload the file straight from my computer, which the recording should be pretty clean, to YouTube. So you can watch the whole thing uh, fresh and well streamed um, on uh, YouTube.com slash Games Hotline. So please check us out there and maybe give us a sub because that helps us uh, grow our audience and get these videos out there. Um, yeah, so that's it, y'all. Thank you so much. You can join me next week when we talk to Susan Wismar about bystander intervention for online sexual harassment, which should be an intense and also great conversation. Bye, everyone.